Hi, I'm Claire Kenyon, and I'm currently working in teaching and outreach in the School of Physics, the University of Melbourne. Although you might have heard my voice or seen my face every so often as Red Lipped Astro on radio and TV, and also occasionally in print. I am also finishing off my PhD in astrophysics, specialising in a particularly bright and active type of galaxy called a quasar, under the supervision of Professor Rachel Webster. For some of you, the word quasar might be familiar, but for those of you left in the dark by astrophysics, don't worry, I won't be taking up comedy anytime soon, a galaxy is a collection of roughly 100 billion stars. That's 100,000 million since the North American and the French conspired to take over our numbering system, and some gas and dust. Held together by gravity, a large number of these galaxies are home to a central supermassive black hole, with a typical mass of between a million and a billion times the mass of the Sun. In some galaxies, for some reason, this central supermassive black hole becomes particularly hungry and active. It chews through a vast amount of material encircling the event horizon, patiently waiting for its own demise. This accretion disk, a ring of gas and dust, is a turbulent place and produces an immense amount of energy from the extreme environment, blasting nearby clouds with an enormous amount of radiation, from X-rays down to the lowest radio energies. There is sometimes even a jet of spiralling charged particles spearing out from the axial centre of the quasar. Evidence suggests that some currently well-behaved galaxies used to be much more active in the past, so there seems to be a process whereby this central region comes alive. When supermassive black holes switch on or activate in this way, we have an active galactic nucleus, or AGN, and we call the galaxy a quasar. I should point out at this moment that the word quasar is a contraction of the words quasi and stellar, because when they were first discovered, they really did just look like stars, discrete pinpoints of light on developing plates although their behaviour and radiation put them firmly in the weird category. Even now, the nucleus of a quasar, the AGN itself, is so small, so spatially tiny, that there is zero chance we can get anywhere near to directly imaging it at all. So how do we find out anything about it? Well, the answer is, with a little difficulty. One of the tricks of the astrophysical trade is to use incoming light from a source in the sky and split it up into many wavelengths. We look for telltale signs in these spectra, which are plots of flux versus wavelength, of physical phenomena we might already know, either from our own interactions on the Earth or from simulations. Sometimes we see signatures that we don't recognise and physics has to scramble to catch up. This is my PhD research in a nutshell. I examine the overlapping space in the Venn diagram of real quasar spectra on one side and Earth-run computer simulations on the other, looking for clues about the gases. What are they? How dense are they? What are they doing? And also the system. Whereabouts are the gases situated? And how much and what kind of light do they receive from the accretion disk? Quasars have been an enigma for over half a century, and their physical natures and evolution still remain at the forefront of astrophysical research. When we step back and look on our life path up to the present, we very often find the trail to be twisted, sometimes looping back on itself, and occasionally dark and foggy with no way to see the path forward. Equally, we have moments where we are presented with bright, clear travel days, beautiful scenic vistas and choices between two, three or more different but clearly good paths to take. Very often, I would almost even say pretty much every time, we end up in a completely different location to where we imagined we'd be when we first set out. The maps we are given at the beginning turn out to be mostly just a general guide to the close-minded possible, rather than a true indication of the many twists and turns that form a true journey. Or maybe that's just me. I started off the typical bright-eyed and bushy-tailed first-year student in a music degree at the University of Melbourne almost 20 years ago. Having only picked up the double bass some year and a half earlier, the infatuation with a working life revolving around music did, unfortunately, fade and I found myself halfway through my second year of undergraduate studies fishing around for something else to do. 
I return to my first love, science, smashing through the Bachelor of Science with two separate majors, mathematical physics and geology, and also a couple of diplomas in music and also criminology, because why not? After that, I headed out to the big bad world. I fossicked for gold in a mine, dodged massive trucks in dark tunnels, and marked out positions for the next explosives blast in the middle of West Australia. Don't worry, as a mine geologist, that was part of my job. I carted myself off to Abu Dhabi and worked in an office job, quickly becoming bored, and enrolling in a Master of Science in Astronomy online degree. After a year, I headed to England and completed a teaching qualification, the equivalent of the one-year postgraduate diploma we used to have here in Australia. And as part of the course, I taught in a UK classroom for a year. I decided another master's, this time in education, was worthwhile, even though I spent the next year and a half backpacking through Europe, the US and Canada. So I remember writing part of my thesis on the top of one of those red double-decker buses in London. I returned to Australia and began working as a physics, science and maths teacher in a high school, where, bringing my students to one of the University of Melbourne School of Physics outreach events, I ran into my first year physics professor. He told me I should hurry up and begin a PhD, as I was getting a bit long in the tooth. I should note, I was the truly wizened and withered ripe old age of 27. So I did. True to form, after six months, I switched out the study of the very small superconductors and medical physics of experimental particle physics for studies of the large scale, in terms of size, mass and time, physics that draws our attention to the sky and beyond. I remember the day quite clearly. I marched into Rachel Webster's office and said, Rachel, I have an APA. I'm basically free labour. Can I work on quasars with you? And she found me something to work on. Coming back to study after so many years off and working was definitely a shock, and I took a long time to find my stride. Being heavily involved in education before my PhD meant I was naturally drawn to teaching, and I did a lot of this during my first few years of my doctorate. Naturally, when my PhD scholarship ran out, I discovered I had spent far too much time on teaching and not enough on my own research, but luckily Rachel and I found a way to balance my studies with my skills, and I got a job as the Labie Teaching and Outreach Fellow, which focuses on linking the School of Physics with the outside community with a major focus on a program called Telescopes in Schools. Telescopes in Schools, or TIS, is basically what it says on the tin. I lend a school a scope, and we're talking about a very high grade and heavy telescope with all the bells and whistles and amazing seeing capabilities. I run professional development for the teachers, and then they run observation nights for their students and school communities with the help of some University of Melbourne physics volunteers. I also run the Year 10 Work Experience Program, which sees some 80 plus students come into the School of Physics for one week a year. I've been incredibly fortunate to be part of the faculty for an amazing initiative we run in Nepal every 18 months called the Kathmandu Astrophysics School, which aims to upskill Nepali graduate students in both a professional and academic sense so that they can better compete globally, as well as produce a higher quality teaching experience for their own high school students when they leave university. It's just one of the many incredible opportunities I've had in this job. I would say, looking back now, there's a clear path through my academic and professional career that has led me to this point, which is actually a fairly obvious thing to say. Wherever you are, there you are, and you got here from there by going from there to here. For sure, I've had some lucky outcomes from the choices I've made, but ultimately I've been relatively fortunate in that I've nearly always found something to be interested in for everything I've come across. I draw the line at Brussels sprouts. I would never have been able to switch research focus and walk into Rachel's office if I hadn't worked hard and cared about what I was doing in the times before that. If I hadn't had my teaching skills that I picked up in the UK, I probably wouldn't have suited TIS so much. So I suppose the take home message here is don't be scared to follow a wandering path and don't worry if your life isn't the straight line on the map that you've been given, etched away by the millions of trudging feet before you. Just make sure your survival backpack of life tools is full and your eyes are open so you can walk the road at full stride. <laughs>